morning. Welcome to church today. Thankful for your faithfulness and attendance here this morning. And what a beautiful day to come to church. And I so appreciate everyone that's come out today. We're going to get started this morning by singing a good song. You will take your songbook, turn to page 364. 364, we'll sing Standing on the Promises. We're thankful for the Word of God. Let's all stand as we sing it out. 364. church service. Our Father, we thank you for this time together. We are thankful for the Word of God, the yep. promises that you've given us. Those sure are something solid we can stand upon in this life. Lord, we pray that you bless our service. Lord, I know that there are folks that have come on purpose today, Lord, to hear from you. I pray that you would meet with us in a special way. May our hearts be drawn close to you. And then, Lord, I pray that we'd be helped from being in church. If there's a need that can be met, Lord, I pray you'd open the eyes of that person, give them help this morning. And then most importantly, Father, if someone does not know for sure that they'd go to heaven today, Lord, would you speak to their heart? Yeah. Perhaps today would be that yes. day that they trust you. We'll be careful to praise you for all that you do today. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. You can be seated. Let's keep our psalm books open. Turn over to page 125. 125. We'll sing the solid rock, the solid yep. rock, page number 125. Let's lift our voices now, sing to the Lord, page 125. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds with in the veil on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand his oath his covenant his blood support me in the whelming flood when all around my soul 
gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, on other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, in him be found rest in his righteousness alone faultless to stand me for the throne on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand amen that's a going to be kind of the theme of the message in a little while, talking about the solid rock, but so thankful uh, for the Lord. He is surely good to us. Thank you for being here today, and it's always good to have folks in church. Good to have folks visiting today. We appreciate you coming and being with us. Lancasters have a friend, Miss Tammy. It's good to have her. Hey, it's good to have uh, the uh, Jaegers with us uh, in the back, and sir, good to have you with us today. Great to be made to feel welcome. If you don't mind to fill out the visitor card, I trust you got one. And if you would mind to do that, drop it in the offering plate. We'd appreciate that. So good to see you. Let's go over a few announcements this morning. We'll go through our bulletin here. I've got several things that I want to mention this morning. We'll start off with our missionary of the week like we always do. <clears throat> and we're focusing on uh, Brother Josh and Miss Sonia Poss. Their last name, yeah. P-O-S-S, -S, and they are missionaries in Ecuador, a great family, uh, just a wonderful family, a young family, they've got young kids, been on the mission field for quite a while now, and uh, we're praying for them this week that the Lord would bless their ministry, yeah. encourage you to do that, remember them. And then uh, some prayer requests I want to give you this morning. If you would, remember to pray for the Gibson family, Pastor Gibson up in Huntsville at Sweet Springs Baptist <laughs> Church. Wife passed away unexpectedly last week. She's 56. And of course, we've been praying for them. They had a funeral just a few days ago. And, but let's uh, lift that family up in prayer. Let them know. If, if you know them, if you have a way to get in touch with them, let them know you're thinking about them. And I know that they would appreciate that. Miss Louise Houston has not been feeling well this week. She's been under the weather and uh, just having a hard time getting on top side. If you would pray for her, I know she would appreciate it very much as well as all of our shut-ins. Honestly, I put that on the prayer list today. Maybe just focus on all of our shut-ins this week a little bit extra. Send them a note, send them a text or a phone call. Let them know you're praying for them. And that's a difficult path in life when you can't get out. Um, so let's remember them this week. And then one more that's not in the bulletin. Uh, pray for Brother Tilford, Tilford McBain. He had emergency surgery this uh, actually yesterday and had his gallbladder removed. And so he, I spoke with him yesterday afternoon. He's out of the surgery, on his way to recovery. But let's pray for him that he would make a full recovery, be able to get back home. Oh, maybe today or tomorrow, he said, depending on how well things go. And uh, so that'd be a blessing to pray for him. Uh, here's the announcements for today. Today, uh, we had a meeting on Wednesday night regarding church camp this summer. Several young people interested in going. We need to finalize that today, so if you were uh, to let me know if you can remember to do that, we'll send in our pre-registration for camp this summer. That'll be a blessing. Along that uh, same uh, note, sometimes folks are interested in, in helping to sponsor a child, or maybe you've got some work that needs done, and they can work and earn some money for camp. We've got a couple months to do that. We go to camp in July, so if you let me know, We'll pass that word along to some of the kids, and maybe you can line them up to, I don't know, work them hard, you know. Give them all the dirty jobs. Uh, give them the things that you don't want to do. And uh, I like for the kids to earn their money, and they're good at doing that. And we'll perhaps have a fundraiser if needed uh, a little bit later on as well. Tonight we'll have a business meeting. I look forward to this business meeting tonight. Presented some things last month to think about, pray about. And so what we want to do tonight is talk about uh, the remodel of the old church building. We've got pricing on uh, getting new carpet for over there and, um, and painting. So we want to freshen that up. And 
we're gonna we're looking at building another uh, handicap ramp over there and uh, just get that building where we, maybe we can use it for some other things and a little bit of an activity center for the children as well and so uh, I hope you can be here tonight if, if uh, you're a member and want to have your input have uh, a little bit more knowledge of what's going on we'll talk about that and give you some updates on some other things that's going on we're excited to be able to do that Mother's Day Sunday next week it's uh, that time of the year already so hope that you'll remember your moms if you're a mom we want you to be here we want to recognize you have a special Sunday next week we'll have a, a gift for all the moms just to show you our appreciation and uh, well like they always say if it wasn't for moms we sure wouldn't be here would we and so we love the moms and, and sure appreciate all them some other things coming up I'll not really take time to to go over these announcements but we'll have the Lord's Supper in a couple of weeks and then another VBS meeting and uh, get things underway for that so several things taking place of course we've got church tonight at six o'clock and a church on Wednesday night uh, like we do so uh, be faithful to the services let's take our song book and um, I know brother Carol's got a song picked out but I want to sing this song next and um, one that we don't sing a lot page 129 It'll go along with the message this morning, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me, page number 129. And uh, the Lord Jesus, He is our solid rock. We sang about that. We sang about the promises. And let's sing this good song. And then ushers, if you will be ready, we'll take up our offering. 129. it's that time time for the offering and we're here can you believe it's may already today is the first sunday of may first day of may and so we're here to new month new budget new bills this month and things so let's be faithful the lord sure has blessed us and let's be faithful in that back to him let's ask the lord's blessing on this offering this morning Brother chester would you lead us in our prayer Amen.
will, take your Bibles this morning, turn to the book of Colossians. The book of Colossians. And uh, get to the scripture reading here in just a second. In the New Testament there, Colossians will be in chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, if you have found your place and if you're able to, would you stand as we read the scripture this morning? We'll just read two verses, Colossians chapter 2, we'll read verses 6 and 7 this morning. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. If you will, follow along as I read. The Bible says, As ye therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and builded up in him, Established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. I want you to notice that phrase there in verse number 7. The Bible says we are to be rooted and built up in Him. We talked about the solid rock. We sang about the rock of ages. Uh, I want to preach a message with this thought this morning. Rooted in Christ. Rooted in Christ. You say, what are you talking about? Well, you'll... Follow along and we'll understand it here in a minute. And so let's do this. We'll have a word of prayer. I'll have you be seated. We'll have a special song. And then after that, I'll come and preach this morning. Our Father, we love you. We thank you for the word of God. How precious it is to us. that We can have a copy of what you want us to know in our hand today. God, I pray that you would bless the preaching time. We understand this is the most important time of the hour, preaching of your word. Lord, as we open up the Bible now, I pray that you would speak to our hearts. And Lord, as we often pray, I pray that you would, Lord, bind the devil from the plate, this place, bind Satan. We know he wants to distract. He wants to cause disruption. He doesn't want us to get the message today. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd help there. And then, Lord, help us to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit, that we would learn the truth, that would be drawn close to you. Lord, I need your help as I preach. Father, take control, I pray. Give me the thoughts and words that you'd have for me. Lord, I just want to be a vessel used this morning. Pray that you bless this song, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Through 
I love that song. That song was written by Ron Hamilton. Maybe that name is familiar. He is. He and his wife uh, Shelley have written. I don't even know. Probably hundreds of gospel songs. And the founder of the Patch the Pirate Clubs. We use those at church on Wednesday night. Years ago, I believe the story goes that. Mr. Hamilton in his 20s had developed, I believe it was cancer in the eye, and his eye was removed, and so he had a patch put on, and the kids at church started calling him Patch. And from there, the Lord used that to inspire him to use this as a ministry to reach people, and he became known as Patch the Pirate back in the 80s. And I remember listening to all the, well, (laughs) cassette tapes back in the 80s, and I don't go back as far as the as the uh, uh, eight, track. eight track. That's what I was trying to think of. Uh, but cassette tapes, we listen to all those patch tapes, and and are still around today. And he wrote that song, "Rejoice in the Lord." He makes no mistakes. Amen. He knows the end of the path that I take. For when I'm tried and purified, I shall come forth as gold. That was his life's theme. And he went through so many things in life, personally, family, different things and troubles and trials. Now he is uh, up in years and he has dementia. I'm not sure if it's Alzheimer's, but I know he has dementia real bad. His wife is such a jewel, just such a blessing to, she journals their story on Facebook and you can follow it. And always, every single day almost, giving God praise and using their trial to try to encourage others, be a blessing. What a great, great testimony. And of the Hamiltons, they've done so much good all across our country. Well, today I want to draw our attention to this phrase in Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 7. The Bible tells us to be rooted in Christ. To be rooted in Christ. I was driving across the I-70 bridge the other day, and I don't often drive on I-70 that way. We take the old 40 and go to Columbia, but I happened to be in Boonville, and I headed up to Columbia, and I was driving over the I-70 bridge. I noticed the construction that's been taking place on the new bridge that will be open. uh, Well, I'm not sure when, but it'll be open soon. And uh, the construction taking place, and I couldn't help but notice as one of the first things of their construction is to, well, they're removing part of the, the hillside there, but, but they're beginning to put those pillars down in the river. The pillars that will be, I'm sure, constructed uh, maybe of concrete, lots of steel in it, and that will support the weight of the bridge, the weight of all the traffic. And as I began to think about that, I, well, just naturally thought that it's important that those pillars are placed right. It's important important that those pillars are rooted deep in something that is firm. Why, you say, is that important? Well, uh, if I'm going to drive over that bridge, I want to make sure it's solid. I don't want it falling down. I don't want it uh, tearing up because of the foundation. I think that's uh, understood, if anything, in life. Is going to succeed, it's going to have to have a good foundation. We sing with the children the little song, uh, The wise man built his house upon the rock. And when the rains come, that house stands firm. Why? Because it has a solid foundation. It's rooted deep in something. They sing that second verse, The foolish man, however, built his house upon a sand. While it might look good, it may stand for a while, Eventually, it's going to come crumbling down, and uh, that foundation isn't firm. Now, if there's something that we need in Christianity, if there's something that we need in churches, I believe it is this, and I'll use this word, stability. Stability. We need folks that are rooted in something firm. Matter of fact, we could say on the opposite hand, uh, there's probably a lot of instability, A lot of folks that are just carried about with whatever comes their way, there's no uh, foundation to their life, and uh, that becomes known. 
Their life sometimes might begin to fall apart. It might be evident in their own life and their, the generations to come. So it's important that we are stable as a Christian. We sang the song a little bit earlier, the solid rock. And uh, the solid rock, that is Jesus. And uh, he is the foundation or should be the foundation of the Christian life. But I believe there's a secret to stability. Uh, there's some gold nuggets we can find in Scripture that will help us to become uh, the type of Christian that is just steadfast. The type of Christian that is rock solid, uh, well, like a Chevy, amen, solid like a rock. And if you're a, a Ford or, G, or Dodge person this morning, well, uh, I guess that's okay. As long as it gets you from point A to point B. But, uh, but we ought to be solid. Now, there's a process of stability. And I think it's, it's evident through these verses. Verse number six tells us, uh, the first thing is, as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. The first part of becoming stable is that we would receive Christ. We've got to have Christ in our life. He has got to be our Lord and Savior. Now, uh, I think that we have to understand that uh, this is a, a concept that honestly I, I believe is few and far between in today's society. That folks honestly have received Christ into their heart and life. Now, obviously, I think it makes sense in order to be a solid Christian. First of all, we must be saved. We use that term saved. That means I am saved from eternal damnation in a place called hell. Christ has saved me from that. He has, uh, he has rescued me from where my sin would take me. And that is a place called hell. I'm saved from that. I'm saved to an eternal life in heaven. A place that is wonderful. That's what we use, and that's what we mean when we use the word saved. Now, uh, I believe it's obvious that unsaved people can never be stable Christians. Uh, we're talking about being rooted in Christ. We're talking about being grounded as a Christian. An unsaved person can never be a stable Christian. Why? They don't have the foundation settled. They don't have it nailed down in their life. Now, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, I think the statistics today would probably probably be staggering if we knew how many people that say they're a Christian are actually saved. Are actually right. saved. When we use the term Christian, I believe it's used very loosely in our society today. Uh, if there was a poll that came out and folks could check whether or not they were a Christian, I believe many people would check, yes, I'm a Christian, meaning that in their minds that they know who Jesus is, that they uh, attend maybe some sort of a church, and uh, yes, they try to live a good, decent, moral life. I think that's probably most people's definition of Christian. But, that, the, but the Bible says uh, it's more than that. Uh, Christian is to be Christ-like. Well, uh, we can never be Christ-like if we first have not accepted it in my heart and life, being saved. But let me give you this quote that I read, and it's, uh, I'll read it a couple times. And really think about this. It says, within every congregation, talking about church membership, there is a small nucleus of people who believe and they are surrounded by, by a much larger group who believe that they believe. This was given by a fellow named James Moffat. Let me read it again. Think about it. Within every congregation, there is a small nucleus of people who believe. And they are surrounded by a much larger group who believe that they believe. What, what is this referring to? In most churches... And I don't know about our church. I believe that we're a Bible-believing church. We preach a, a, a gospel message straight from the Word of God. But perhaps in the majority of churches, there's only a small group of people that actually believe in Christ. And I'm talking about a percentage of a membership, folks that are on the rolls. And they're surrounded by a larger group of people who think that they're going to heaven but in all reality, they're not trusting in Christ. They have a false hope. Uh, the, the deception probably 
would be staggering if there was a percentage. I heard or read uh, this statistic by Dr. J. Harold Smith. He said this, 75% of people that attend church won't make it to heaven. He goes on to say, I wouldn't be afraid to say 80% won't make it. Now, I'm not necessarily saying I believe that of our church. I, again, I believe that we're a Bible preaching and teaching church. I believe that uh, we have the Word of God here and, and uh, we can trust what our Bible says that we teach. But we know uh, the idea of church in general, there are many different opinions and ideas about how to go to heaven. And perhaps if this guy is true, he says 75% of church attenders won't make it to heaven. Why? They're not rooted in Christ. They're not saved. The number one cause of instability in churches or Christian would be the lack of true salvation. Folks aren't really born again. Uh, and I'm not going to stay here on this point very long, but, uh, but, but if you struggle with that, if you don't know for sure, don't live your life, don't take a gamble on well, I hope I know. I, I think I know. I've heard the stories and I believe I do. Oh, listen, it's a simple way of salvation. It's believing that Jesus died for you, putting your faith in Him and in Him alone. The Bible talks about that there are sheep and goats among the flock, among the churches. And the Bible says one day the goats will be scattered. That is those who think they're born again, but they're not. What a sad day that will be. And so I'm just saying, first of all, uh, in the order of being stable, you have to receive Christ. But then the second thing is we must be rooted in Christ. We, we have got to come to a point where we are grounded in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are grounded in the Word of God. It makes sense that in order for something to be stable, it must be rooted. You've got to have roots that go down and grab a hold of something that helps you to become stable. Not too many years ago, three or four years ago, we poured this concrete out here and uh, you know, added on to our concrete parking lot. Well, we removed those shrubs, those beautiful shrubs, amen, that were overgrown and, I don't know, they seemed 15 foot tall. We removed those shrubs, and so we got the chainsaw, and, and, and uh, we cut them out, we hauled them off, but then we had to get the roots out. I tell you what, those roots were way down deep. And we could not pull them out with the tractor. We hooked up the John Deere tractor, a big tractor, couldn't pull it out. They ended up having to be dug out uh, with, a, I think it was a mini excavator, and dug those things out. You say, why are they so uh, hard to get out? They were rooted. They weren't going anywhere. I mean, they were sunk in and... Uh, no matter what came, wind, storm, tornado, I guarantee you those things weren't moving. That's what it means to be rooted in something. Now, as a Christian, it is essential. I, I mean, listen, it's of utmost importance that we are rooted in Christ. What are you rooted in today? Uh, you might be born again, and that's the most important thing. But if you're not rooted in the Word of God... If you don't study, if you're not rooted in Christ, hey, listen, you're going to be tossed around. You're going to be this and that one day. Why? Because you're not rooted. Uh, let, let me, uh, again, emphasize what this says. Rooted in, help me now, what does the Bible say? Rooted in Christ. Well, it doesn't say rooted in Christ. It says rooted and built up in Him. But I, the title of the message, rooted in Christ. Rooted in Christ. Now, it's important, the Bible doesn't say that you are rooted in the church. doesn't say that at all. The Bible doesn't say, I'm supposed to be, uh, I mean, just uh, lock, stock, and barrel, I'm sold out to my church. No, it says rooted in Him. Uh, the Bible doesn't say you, you should be rooted in a pastor. Uh, hey, listen, if you're rooted in me, if all your faith is in me and what I say, uh, hey, listen, uh, you're going to be highly disappointed someday. Why? Because I'm going to fail you. I'm going to mess up. I'm going to lead you astray, perhaps. Hey, listen, I can tell you of Christians today, and I'll be honest with you, even at times in my life where I have been shaken because somebody that I respected and looked up to messed up. They, they left the faith, perhaps. I, I know folks that aren't even in church today that I looked up to. 
I know folks that are sitting a, in a jail cell today, today that I looked up to. And, and to be honest with you, man, it, it, it's kind of, it's tried to shake me. And I think, man, my, somebody that, that was a, a hero in my eyes, and now look at what's happened. Is all the things that they said true? I mean, what's going on here? And I have to quickly check myself and say, wait a minute. I'm not rooted in that person. I'm rooted in Christ Jesus. And I know the Bible's true. I know what I read is true. And yes, what they taught me was true. But the devil's real and he came along and he, uh, and he got them sidetracked. So uh, I'm just saying, listen, don't be rooted in the church. Don't be rooted in the pastor. Don't be rooted in your spouse or your family. But get to a place where you're rooted in Christ. Are you walking with the Lord today? Do you seek His will? Are you studying His Word? That's why we come to church, to help learn about Him. Got to be rooted in Him, not rooted in a movement. Don't be rooted in a denomination. Don't be rooted in a place, but be rooted in a person. And that's Jesus Christ. We ought to respond to Christ. Respond to Him. So we have to receive Him. The Bible says in verse 6, receive Him. The Bible says in verse 7 to be rooted in Him. Uh, and so now look at what it says. Um, rooted and built up in Him, verse 7, and established in the faith. We'll talk about that in a moment, to be established. And then it says this, this next phrase, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So what are we to do? Verse 6 says, walk in Him. Verse 7 says, as ye have been taught. Walk in the Lord. As you have been taught. What does this mean? Well, the letter R, to keep with that, we said receive Christ, be rooted in Him, and then respond to Christ. If He has spoken to your heart, you ought to just do it. If you have found out what God's instructions for you are in the Word of God, you ought to walk in that. The Bible says uh, that as the disciples lived upon the earth, uh, you know, 2,000 years ago, Jesus he came, he was born, he began his ministry, and he had those close followers that walked with Christ. And sometimes I can be honest with you, I'm a little bit jealous of them because they got to have the Lord with them. I mean, if they didn't have an answer, they'd just walk over and say, Lord, uh, help me out with this. And they walked with him. I mean, uh, hand in hand, walking with the Lord. Now, we can't do that today. Why? Obviously, the Lord is not with us in person. We don't walk with Christ. So what do we do? Well, we walk in Christ. That's why the Bible says in verse number 6, walk in Him. Walk in, walk in Christ. Uh, we don't have the Lord with us as far as physically, but the Lord is in me. The Holy Spirit lives inside if I'm a Christian. And so we can walk in in Christ. Stable Christians are those that have been saved. They've been born again. Stable Christians are those that have been rooted in Christ. They begin to find out what the Word of God says, and then they respond to that. They've been taught the faith. They respond to it. And perhaps this is something that we deal with today. In our churches, people claim to be saved, and Hey, listen, people claim to know the Bible. I think uh, we could probably have, uh, you know, Bible trivia this morning, and uh, you all could answer a lot of questions about the Bible. But here's the question. Am I responding to what the Bible says? The Bible says, To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. You know, there's not just sins of commission. And it's easy to focus on those things. Why? Because, well, they're evident in, in, in our daily life. You know, things that uh, people do they shouldn't be doing. Jail is full of people, listen, that have done things that they shouldn't have done. Uh, most of the time, the disciplinary actions of parents is uh, on their children of committing things that they shouldn't have done. If you go over to the schools, uh, probably the most uh, disciplinary action that takes place is kids doing things they're not supposed to be doing. But you know, just as equal to sins of commission, there are sins of omission. And when we know we're supposed to be doing something and we don't do it, 
The Bible says that's sin. Uh, this is where the rubber meets the road to us as Christians uh, because we are to walk in Christ. The Bible says, As ye have received the Lord, walk in Him as ye have been taught. That's putting these three things together. Am I responding to Christ? Paul encouraged them to abound with thanksgiving. Abound. Uh, we find the word abound uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, and it implies to be rooted in Christ. Uh, let me quote that scripture for you. The Bible says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, here it is now, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Hey, listen, Paul says to abound uh, here with thanksgiving. This implies to be rooted, to be steadfast, to be stable, to be unmovable. And uh, when you can become, listen, unmovable in life, when you can become rooted in Christ, when you're a stable Christian, I believe you'll be an abounding Christian. You'll be a Christian that has thanksgiving. You'll be a Christian that has your focus right. The definition of unmovable, as I quoted in 1 uh, Corinthians, means not to be moved from its place. It means to be unmoved. It means to be firmly persistent. Firmly persistent. The truth is, the progression of instability will not only affect me and perhaps my children, but I believe it will affect the generations to come. And perhaps one reason why generations can go maybe two or three, four generations and completely not know anything about God can be attributed to instability, inconsistency, unstableness. We went through the book of Genesis, well, not the entire book, but the life of Joseph. It covers many chapters in Genesis. And Jacob, the dad, gave, he talked about Reuben. And he was at the end of his life, and all the boys had come. He wanted them to come around his bed, and Reuben was one of the older boys. And <clears throat> Jacob came to Reuben, and, well, he couldn't give him the blessing that he wanted to. Obviously, he was able to bless some of his children, and, and Joseph, he was able to receive a blessing. Reuben couldn't receive a blessing in Genesis chapter 49. Now, Reuben had a lot of potential. He was the firstborn son. I mean, the, the firstborn meant a lot. They would get that birthright. They would get the blessing. They would be able to, uh, most of the time, succeed in life with the blessing of their parent. Reuben had so much potential. But here's what he was described as in Genesis 49. His daddy described him as my firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. But then in verse number 4, just as much as Jacob had praised his firstborn son, just as much as he had, I believe in his heart, wanted to give him that blessing, wanted to leave him that inheritance, give him that birthright, he had to do a 180. And I believe as Reuben was standing there, and perhaps he began to feel a little bit of sense of pride as his daddy is talking about who he is, my firstborn, my strength, my excellency. Then Reuben turn, or then Jacob turns. He begins to describe who he really is. He says in verse number 4 of Genesis chapter 49, Reuben was unstable as water. He said to Reuben, you will not excel. You will not succeed. You're not going to get the blessing. You're not going to get the birthright. Why? Because you are unstable. Then he likened it to water. And uh, what took place that day was Jacob, instead of receiving a blessing, he received a curse. 
Uh, Reuben received the curse, rather, uh, because he lacked the moral character that he should have had in his life. He labeled him as unstable as water. Many Christians suffer from that same instability. Unstable as water. Some things you could draw from this statement about Reuben being unstable as water. We think about water, its temperature is affected by its environment. Water doesn't hold its own temperature. It will become whatever's around it. You set a glass of ice-cold water from the refrigerator out into a room, what's going to take place? After a while, it'll become room temperature. If you take that uh, cup of water and then place it on the stove, after a while, what's going to take place? It's going to become boiling water. Why? Because it takes uh, on its environment. It's affected by its environment. Water, something else, it will take on the shape of the container that it's placed in. That's just water. It has no stability in of itself. Water will always take the path of least resistance. Man, how many Christians are like that? The path of least resistance, not steadfast, not unmovable. We're just tossed to and fro. Water is easily contaminated. Water weakens and undermines everything it touches. And over time, water will destroy things. The Bible's clear that unstable people struggle in areas that stable Christians do not struggle in. Very clear. Now, let me give you just a few things here that I believe will help us understand the importance and no, not necessarily secrets. These aren't any big secrets. But I believe give us uh, some help in becoming a stable Christian. You will take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. If you're in Colossians, keep on turning toward the end of the Bible, and uh, you'll get there in just a few pages. Hebrews and then James. We'll look at chapter 1, verse number 8. James 1, verse number 8. Here's what the Bible says. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Is unstable in all his ways. Being unstable leads to frustration. This is uh, something I want us to understand here. Being unstable leads to frustration. You see, the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Uh, these folks are not just unstable in their Christianity, but in all their ways. If you're double-minded, what does that mean? You're not consistent. You've got uh, two ways about you. You're not, uh, you're not uh, rooted in Christ. You're not, you don't have your foundation in the Word of God. You're double-minded. You go this way one day, this way another. You, you, you change with the tides. You change with the wind. You're double-minded. The Bible says you're unstable. You can't be that way as a Christian. Uh, listen, you, you've got to nail down what you believe. And listen, our day and time, we need folks that are stable. They say, this is what I believe. I'm going to stand for truth and right. And uh, I don't want to become unstable. That will lead to frustration. You know, if you're unstable as a Christian, you'll be frustrated. You'll be frustrated. Why isn't the Lord blessing here? It seems like this never, uh, you know, all the time I'm just failing. I'm failing. I'm not succeeding. Uh, what about our relationships in life? What about our marriages? What about our families? If we are not stable, we're just going to have frustration after frustration after frustration. The decisions that I make will be all over the place. There'll be no consistency. There'll be no conviction in my life. We're unstable. Because of that, we'll be frustrated I'll read a verse in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 14. The Bible says, Having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin. And then there's a phrase here, Beguiling unstable souls. A heart that they have exercised with covetous practices 
cursed children. I just want to pull that phrase out of there. Beguiling, unstable souls. What does this mean? Unstable people are easily deceived. You're easily deceived. They can be beguiled. That, that means tricked. And uh, unstable people, if you don't read the Word of God, if you don't root yourself in Christ in the Bible, you're going to be exposed to things that aren't true and you'll not know the difference. You'll be tricked. You'll be uh, vulnerable to false teachers and false doctrine. Hey, listen, with the inventions of, of the, uh, the Internet and all the things that are available, it's an easy tool to want to go out there and study something pertaining to Scripture. But the honest truth is this. There's a million different opinions. How am I supposed to know what's right and what's not right? How am I supposed to know whose opinion lines up with Scripture? I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to get in the Word of God. You need to read it for yourself. You need to pray for yourself. Say, Lord, help me. Give me understanding. You know, this is an old example and illustration, but it's so true. And I've heard that with bank tellers, they don't have a particular type of training that helps them to determine what's counterfeit. And when a counterfeit bill comes through, I mean, sure, they, they I'm sure, have seen counterfeit bills, but they don't train their eye necessarily to spot the fake money. But you know how they spot the fake money when it comes through? They are so used to handling the real stuff all the time. I mean, they know what it feels like uh, to, the, to the touch. They, they see it. They handle the real stuff that as soon as something fake comes through, there's a difference. And that's the same thing as a Christian. We ought to be so familiar with the Word of God. I'm not saying have it memorized forwards and backwards. I'm not saying be able to have all the answers for people's problems. But we ought to be faithful at studying, being in church Sunday morning. For Sunday school, we study the Bible. You hear the preaching in the morning service, the evening services, where we are so familiar with God's Word that when something comes along, we say, wait a minute. That just doesn't sound right to me. That just doesn't line up with what I have read in Scripture. An unstable person is easily deceived. We see the fighting of the unstable in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 16. And I use that word fighting, I'll explain what I mean. But the Bible says, 2 Peter 3, 16, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, W-R-E-S-T, rest, as they do also the other Scriptures, unto their own destruction. Uh, what do you mean by the word fighting? Well, uh, here's what I mean. They are twisting Scripture. The word rest literally means to twist, to turn awry, to torture, uh, it means to pervert. It means to take something that has a certain meaning, a certain purpose, and to change that into what you want it to fit. Uh, you see, people that are unstable, they're not rooted in the Word of God, and we've got to be careful we don't do this. We'll take something that the Bible says and we'll twist it to make it fit my agenda. Why do we do that? Because we just don't want to be rooted in Scripture. We just don't want to accept what God says and that's just the way it is. How many times have we seen people today, and maybe I've even been guilty of that, taking something, and I didn't want to take it for what it believed, and so I'll twist it, I'll rest, and this is what the Bible says, they that are unlearned and unstable are ones that twist things and twist Scripture, the Bible says it's to their own destruction. I've just given you several things here about being unstable. Let me close by giving you some secrets, again, not necessarily secrets, but some, uh, some things that will help us to become a stable Christian. Become a stable Christian. We'll use Scripture. Number one, how can I become a stable Christian? Well, I need consistent exposure to the Scripture. Consistent exposure to the Scripture. Psalm 1, the Bible says in verse number 2, But his delight 
is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Uh, you know, what, what does this mean? Well, the Bible says that if we want to become a blessed, blessed is the man that walketh not, but it says, his delights in the law of the Lord, he meditates day and night. Verse 3 tells us what we're talking about this morning. If you'll do that, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. What does that mean, be like a tree? Well, you're going to be rooted. You're going to be rooted in something. You're going to be rooted in Christ. And what's going to take place because you're rooted in Christ? Notice what happens to the tree. He's planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. If you want to become stable as a Christian, uh, you need to delight yourself in the Word of God. Be exposed to Scripture. I think it's important that we would read our Bible daily. We would find a Scripture verse to help me today. I think it's important that you would listen to the Word of God. I think it's important that you would be in church uh, and hear the Word of God preached. It's absolutely impossible to be a stable Christian, to be a strong Christian, to be rooted in Christ if I am not feeding on the Word of God. Got to have the Bible. Joshua chapter 1, the Bible says, Only be thou strong, is verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Uh, Joshua says, uh, we need to uh, listen to what Moses told us. And uh, he told us to follow the law. What is that talking about? Well, that was the Word of God back then. Moses was uh, privileged to write the first five books of the Bible known as the law, the law books. Joshua said, we need to follow this. And he goes on to, uh, further to say, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. Don't get sidetracked, but follow it. He said, if you do that, you'll prosper whithersoever you go. He goes on to verse, say in verse 8, Joshua 1, 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. The only place you'll find the word success mentioned, Joshua chapter 1, verse number 8. You say, how do we be successful? How to become a stable Christian? You've got to be exposed to the Word of God. Number two, how can I become a stable Christian? 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We'll look at verse number 11. The Bible says, Now God Himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, He may establish your hearts. Notice this word, unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all His saints. Number two, we need to have a constant examination of sin. Constant examination. Are you, am I looking at my life on a consistent basis? Saying, Lord, would you show me of any sin in my life? Uh, the Scripture says in verse 13, 1 Thessalonians 3.13, To the end, He may establish your heart. That word establish means to make firm, to become grounded, to become rooted. He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness. What does that mean? Well, without sin, we're supposed to be like Christ. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Uh, how am I doing in my life, in my prayer life? Do I go to the Lord and say, God, there's anything in my life that shouldn't be here. Would you show it to me? And then, Father, give me the strength to get that out of my life. Sin affects us more than we realize, Christian. More than we realize. Sin affects the church more than re we would even realize will cause God's blessing from being upon my life. It will cause me to be unstable if I have sin in my life. 
Number three, how can I become a stable Christian? 1 Peter chapter 5. Notice with me what the Bible says here in 1 Peter chapter 5. We'll begin reading in verse number 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered for a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. The Bible tells us in verse number 8 to be sober. It goes on to say, if we're sober, that will help us in our life to, uh, to know what's going on, to realize the devil is real. And the Bible says that we will become perfect, um, not meaning without sin, but mature, and, and then established. There's that word again, rooted, stable, uh, built up in Christ. Uh, so to be sober. What, what do we need to do? Number three is to evaluate my soberness. The word sober means to be on alert. To be on alert. We obviously understand the word sober, uh, and, and often it's used in a reference to someone's uh, drinking or their drunkenness, that now they have sobered up. We understand that alcohol makes a person unaware of their, their senses. They're not in tune with what's going on like they should be. And, uh, you know, side note here, I, I hate alcohol. I don't like anything about alcohol. The Bible teaches so much about it, tells us to abstain from it, don't look at it. And nothing good has ever come from alcohol. And, uh, but the Bible says here to be sober. What does this mean? It means to be on alert. As a Christian, we have got to be on alert in our life. It is so easy to just want to go through life thinking like we've got it made, that we're living on easy street and everything is great. Well, uh, things might be good, but if I let down my guard, guess what's going to happen and take place? The old devil's going to sneak in. I, I need to be sober. I need to be on alert. What's taking place in my life? Do I evaluate my life and do I realize that I have let something creep in that maybe shouldn't be there? Am I that naive and, and uh, just thinking that everything's okay and it'll all work out? Hey, listen, the devil's real. I get so tired of the devil. I preached a message not too long ago on I hate the devil. I get tired of seeing the devil take uh, place and ruin lives and wreck homes and wreck marriages. I mean, it happens on the daily basis. Why? Because folks, well, they're just not sober. They're not on alert. We need to establish, the Bible says in verse number 10, ourself. That means to make stable, to set fast, to strengthen. The Bible talks about soberness in 1 Thessalonians. Therefore, let us not sleep. This is 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. Let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. We have many sleeping Christians oblivious to what's going on around them. Uh, just, just for example, we need to understand, adults, that the devil is real and fighting for our children. We can't be ignorant to the devices that are taking place, to the things that are going on and and, and children's lives now are wrapped up in the Internet. That is the way of life. Whether you want to accept it or not, that is the way of life, friends. We, now, I'm not saying we have to educate ourselves about all how everything works, but we better make sure we understand the devil will use that to steal our children. We can't be ignorant, folks. We can't be asleep. Uh, we've got to understand that the music that children are listening to, uh, a lot of it is straight out of hell. It's awful. It's terrible. Straight from Satan. We can't keep our heads in the sand. So what do we need to do? Teach them. Amen. Sit down with them. Have a talk with them. Say, let me help you with this. I'm just saying there's many sleeping Christians. They don't even realize it. The devil has gotten in. Let me give you the last thing found in James chapter 5. I believe this will help us to become stable. The Bible says in first, I'm sorry, the Bible says in James chapter 5, 
In verse number 7, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. James 5.8, Be also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. I believe that something that will help me to become a stable Christian is this. Okay, here it is now. Realize, Lord's coming back. Lord's coming back. When I would focus on the coming of Christ, when I would let that be a motivating factor in my life, that one day Jesus is coming back. Oh, listen, we often focus on the wonderful time that it'll be, that reunion in the clouds with the Lord. The Bible says that uh, we'll meet our loved ones with the Lord. Man, that's going to be a great time. And I can get excited about that. That motivates me. That keeps me encouraged to keep on trudging through this life. But wait a minute. On the flip side, it's going to be a reckoning day too. It's going to be a judgment day too. Yeah. And if I would become a stable Christian, I believe that I would constantly keep my sights on the Lord's coming back. What's He going to think about this? If the Lord were to come back today and find me as I am today, how would I feel? <laughs> would I be embarrassed? Would I have shame? Well, if he came back right now, I think it'd be a pretty good thing. We're all in church, right? Where we should be. We're doing okay. But what about tomorrow? I'm just saying we ought to have a conscious expectation of the Savior. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, the Bible says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that. When He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And every man that hath his hope in Him purifieth himself, even as He is pure. I'm telling you, you keep your eyes set on the return of Christ, that will help you to live the kind of life you ought to live. Now, I don't want the third and fourth generation to not know about God. We've seen it happen in Scripture. We've seen it happen in our own circle of friends and folks that we know. I don't want that. I believe this is a key to keeping this from taking place in the third and fourth generation that grandchildren, great-grandchildren won't even know who God is. Be a stable Christian. These things will help us to be a stable Christian. One more Scripture verse real quick. Philippians chapter 4, verses 1-9. through nine. This is what Paul is challenging the church here. Therefore, my, beloved, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech you, Odious, and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of the Lord in the book of life. Verse number 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men, the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, with prayer, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then he says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are uh, honest, whatsoever things are just, pure, lovely, good report, if there's any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Paul gives us a tremendous line of Scripture here to help us. But here's what he said in verse number 1. My brethren... He said this, stand. What does that imply? Be stable. Be rooted in Christ. Why should we be rooted? Well, the Lord's coming back. There's a people that need to see us. There's a generation that needs to be reached. Let's be rooted in Christ. Let's know what we believe. Let's get in the Word. Hey, if you're not saved this morning, got to get that settled.
No better time to accept Christ than today. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord, thank You for this time together. Lord, such an important truth here of being rooted in Christ. Lord, it's, it's really not hard, but yet sometimes it is hard. When it comes down to it, we ought to just, well, just stand. It doesn't matter what things take place around me. It doesn't matter the pressure that I get from my friends. It doesn't matter the pressure I get from family. I'm just going to stand. Because we understand that being unstable is a terrible thing. Lord, we'll lose. We'll lose in the third and fourth generations to come because of unstableness. Father, I pray that you bless our time of invitation. Speak to hearts as only you can. In Christ's name, amen. Let me ask you to stand to your feet this morning as we close out. The piano is going to play an invitation song this morning. Let's not pass up an opportunity to spend time with the Lord. And so as the piano plays, why don't you come this morning, spend time with the Lord at the altar, ask Him to help you. If you're not saved today, if you don't know for sure that when you draw your last breath, that you'll wake up in eternity, it's, it's simple. The Bible tells us you can know. It's all about your faith and what you're trusting in. You say, preacher, I'm not sure. I don't know that for sure. I think I would, but to be honest, there's a little bit of doubt in my mind. Why don't you come this morning? I'd be glad to pray with you. Take the Bible and show you what the Bible says about how you can get that settled in your heart. Folks are praying this morning, you mind the Lord, whatever He wants you to do, you mind the Lord this morning.